Our scripture reading for today uh, is from Psalm 23. Uh, I will be reading from the King James Version, and it is all six verses. This is the word of God for the people of God. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father God, we pray right now that these words of life, that they would bring power, that they would find a way into our hearts, Lord, that as you water them through the power of your Holy Spirit, that they will bear fruit in our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, if you've ever been, ever been to a funeral or a graveside service, chances are that you have heard this particular psalm recited there. It is a psalm that is written by David. And although it doesn't necessarily give us enough information in the psalm in terms of when in his life he wrote it or what circumstances he was going through, uh, he does go ahead and tell us there at the beginning that it, it was written by him. Now, it, it, we, we can get a little bit uh, of some context here. Verse 5 hints at least at him having experienced the reality of true enemies in his life. And verse 4 alludes to him having possibly maybe even feared for his life. So with those two verses, we can at least maybe make the, the logical or reach the logical conclusion that he's writing not as a boy uh, any longer, but certainly as a grown adult. Uh, likewise, verse 5 <clears throat> seems to indicate him having some experience of time of victory or peace or prosperity in his life. In verse 6, he's kind of looking both backward in at, at terms of what God has done and forward in his life. So it's possible, again, no, no conclusions can we draw necessarily, but it's possible that it's during his reign as the second king of God's people uh, and the first king to preside over the United Kingdom of Israel and Judah. But whenever he wrote it, it is clear that the main emphasis in this song is the care, protection, and provision that the Lord provides to those who are faithful to put their trust in him as their God. Now, David starts off in verse 1 writing, The Lord is my, is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, being a shepherd is something that David knew quite a, quite a bit about. Uh, when Samuel came looking for the one that God was directing, him to anoint as the future king of Israel that would follow in the footsteps of King Saul. It was David, the youngest of Jesse's sons, uh, who was out in the field tending the sheep. When Saul sent for David to come and be his armor bearer, as well as to play, play the leer in hopes of driving away the harmful spirit that the Lord had sent upon King Saul, it was out in the field with the sheep again that the messengers uh, that the king sent would find David also. It was David who left the sheep in the fields with another keeper as he went to bring provisions, lunch, to his brothers who were on the front lines with the whole Israeli army cowering behind rocks in fear of Goliath and the Philistines in the valley of Elah. And it was David who volunteered to Saul to go and fight Goliath. And in so doing, he gave as credentials his keeper, his being the keeper of his father's sheep, saying that it was the Lord who had delivered him from the paw of the lion and the bear that David had pursued and killed when they came and took some of the sheep from under his care. As a shepherd, he had protected his father's sheep from harmful predators, but he also directed and led them from one pasture to the next, from one watering hole to the next, as well as being the one who went out to find any and all that had gotten lost as they wandered away from him and from the rest of the flock. 
And it is precisely those types of qualities, protecting, leading, providing, and rescuing, that David has in mind when he refers to the Lord, Yahweh, the great I am, as his shepherd, the one who he follows, the one who he trusts, the one who cares for and provides for him. And not just him, not just David, but all the faithful people in Israel. For David was not the only sheep in God's flock. The Lord is the faithful shepherd of all his people. He's able to watch over and protect all of them as well as to provide for all of them. Which is why David then goes on to say, I shall not want. As the faithful shepherd, God can be counted on to provide for the needs of all those who are under his watchful care and leadership. God knows what his sheep, what his sheep need, when they need it, and how to get it for them. For example, look at verse 2 which says, he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leaves me beside still waters. Now, like people, sheep need food. They need water and they need rest. The shepherd knows where the food is, where the green pastures await with the nutrients that the sheep need in order to live as well as to thrive. Now, here in Alabama, <clears throat> especially right now, it might not be that hard to find green pastures of grass or other feed that would be appropriate for sheep. But Israel, the Middle East, now that part of the world isn't well known for plentiful, lush, green pastures as far as perhaps the eye can see. Now the imagery that David uses here is almost more like that of an, an oasis, a grassy patches or patches located in areas that are bordered on all sides with dry and barren ground, void of anything that would serve as food for the sheep. And here then, uh, in this green pasture with ample food to eat and safely under the care and watchful eye of the shepherd, the flock was also able to rest, to lie down and perhaps sleep or at least allow their food to digest without having to eat on the run while trying to evade predators. And as opposed to bringing them to the shores of a raging river, which would bring with it its own perils, the shepherd leads them instead to still or quiet waters, easy to drink from without any unnecessary risk or danger. Now, in addition to taking care of the physical needs of his people, the Lord also takes care of our spiritual needs. The first part of verse 3 says, he restores my soul. Food, water, and rest, those are good and important ingredients in our lives. But unlike the animal world, we have souls, we have a spirit, and those spirits need spiritual nourishment and spiritual attention. When we have sinned, when we feel isolated and ashamed, when we are exhausted and weary, when we are in despair, perhaps have lost hope, feeling unwanted or unloved or unworthy, it is God that has the ability to restore our spiritual health, to refresh and revive us, to restore us to life and into right relationship with him. Now, the rest of verse 3 says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for my name's sake. Following our restoration, he shows us the way, the paths of right walking, of right thinking, of right living. Paths that are for our good, not a burden for us to bear, but a blessing for us to experience and ultimately glorifying to him and to his holy and righteous name. And he gives us also the strength to stay on those paths. But even when we stray, he can be counted on again to restore us again and again and again. The Lord, the faithful shepherd, is always there with us even when there is danger or evil that may want to attack and kill us. Here in verse 4, we come to a verse that is well known to most of us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now the King James and the ESV translations translate the Hebrew word salmawet as shadow of death, whereas some other prominent English trans versions translate it as dark, or darkness, which then changes verse 4 to say the darkest valley. 
keeping then with the metaphor of the shepherd that David has been emphasizing thus far, perhaps what he had in mind then was a dark valley in the desert in which he was referring to the danger of shadows or perhaps actions cast from would-be robbers or animals or perhaps from natural things like flash floods. The point that David is trying to get across is that even in those instances when physical danger was possible or even imminent, that he did not fear the evil or the danger as he had the complete assurance that God, the faithful shepherd, was right there with him and able to protect him. Again, having been a shepherd himself, David knew the tools of the trade. The first tool he had was a rod, which was a thick wooden pole, perhaps maybe like a baseball bat that could be swung to bring great force upon an animal or another person, if necessary, to defend the flock from attack. His second tool, the staff, was a longer piece of wood that could be used to reach a greater distance than the rod, but with a curved section at the end that could be used as a hook around a sheep's neck in order to either redirect the sheep or to pull it from danger to safety. Now these tools, the rod and the staff in the hands of a faithful shepherd were all that was needed to provide for the comfort and safety of the sheep while in the darkness of the valley, whether literally or figuratively. Now in verses five and six, it is unlikely that David is still using at this point the shepherd metaphor, but instead seems to have transitioned to the Lord now as more of a host. As he writes in verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Now any sense of danger that David was alluding to in the first four verses has now passed. And we are once again given a picture similar to the green pasture that, and the still waters that he referenced in verse two. Although now the illusion has moved from David or us as being a sheep to being people in which we are about to celebrate with a bountiful and joyous meal provided by the power, the protection, and the provision of God himself. Because of God, any enemies that we may have or have had have now been made powerless and are literally forced to watch our good fortune, our blessings, being totally unable to hurt us and most likely being envious of our situation while at the same time perhaps discouraged by their own. God anoints his head with oil, which is symbolic of both the consecration or the setting apart of David from the others, as well as a sign of refreshment and rejoicing, having then been freed from any danger or suffering. At this point, David is truly blessed, indicating this with the words and the picture of his cup runneth over or overflowing. And then reflecting perhaps on his life so far and the faithfulness of God and the, in the future as well as the faithful shepherd and the gracious provider that he has already proven himself to be, David finishes in verse six by writing, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Whatever David has faced so far in life, God has faithfully been able to help him through it. God's goodness and mercy he has learned are completely trustworthy. They never fail. And they are the assurance that David clings to each and every day that God will continue to do so in the future and for all the days of his life. Things may not always be ideal. We know that, don't we? They may not always be ideal, but David knows that God will always see him through it. Now, David was from the tribe of Judah not a Levite, not from the tribe of Levi. And as such, he did not literally live in the house of the Lord, which at that time was the tent of meeting as there was no permanent temple yet. What David is saying though, is that because of God's faithfulness, because of his goodness and mercy, he knows that he will be in communion and fellowship with God, having access to him in his sanctuary to be in his presence forever and ever. 
And that is the same promise that we have as well as followers of Jesus, who self-proclaims in John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then again in verses 14 and 15 of that same chapter, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life again for my sheep. Now the Jews of Jesus' time knew Psalm 23 and how David described the Lord as his shepherd. And when Jesus called himself the good shepherd, he was equating himself to God which confused some and angered others. John goes on to record what happens next in verses 24 of 31. He says, so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you. And you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. As it wasn't time yet for Jesus to be betrayed and die, he goes on again trying to convince them that he truly was the Christ, that he truly was God, with him ultimately slipping through their fingers as they tried to arrest him. In the closing moments here today, in light of everything that we just went through in Psalm 23, I want to focus briefly on something that Jesus, the good shepherd himself, said in that last passage in John that I read, specifically verses 25 through 28. Again, when answering their question as to whether or not he was the Christ, he said, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. He goes on to describe his sheep, saying, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now listen to this last verse. Talking about his sheep, Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Funerals are not for the person who has died. They are for the people who are left behind. When the person who died took their last breath, their eternal destination was sealed for all eternity. The people at a funeral or at a graveside ceremony, they are the ones who still have the opportunity to choose where they will spend eternity and how they will live the rest of their lives here in this life. For the believers there at a funeral or graveside, those who have already put their faith and trust as Jesus, as the good shepherd, who knows their name and who follow him, they have already been given eternal life. And in the event that the deceased was also a believer, while the believer mourns and grieves their loss here, we also celebrate the fact that the deceased believer is not dead, but is currently dwelling in the house of the Lord, in the very presence of Jesus, and that as believers, we will see them again. To a believer, Psalm 23 is absolutely a comfort. But for an unbeliever, present at a funeral or graveside ceremony, 
Psalm 23 offers no comfort, no hope, no peace, no hope of healing. I told you that I am the Christ, that I am the shepherd, and you do not believe. You may be among the flock, but you are not among my sheep. When I call out to them, you do not hear my voice. I do not know you, and you do not follow me. The unbeliever cannot say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The believer cannot say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you are here today and have professed Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, as the good shepherd that Jesus claimed to be, and as your shepherd, like David referred to the Lord in Psalm 23, then praise God that you are one of his sheep. Praise God for the cross. Praise God for the resurrection. And praise God that you are forever cleansed by his blood. But if there is anyone here today that has not, then God is calling you this very day. He is saying he wants to be your shepherd. He wants to know you and for you to know him. He wants to give you the free gift of eternal life. He wants you to depend on him to care for you, to protect you, and to provide for you. He wants his goodness and mercy to follow you all the days of your life. He wants you to dwell with him forever and ever. If there is anyone here today who doesn't know the Lord and wants the peace, the protection, the provision, and the promises that go along with the relationship of being one of his sheep and being able to confidently and sincerely say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Is there anybody that finds himself today in that situation? I know I'm preaching to members of Green's Chapel who are professed believers. But it is not too uncommon at times. Even pastors have been known to have gotten saved after they were ordained, believe it or not. I know that sounds strange, but it can happen. And it's okay. Is there anyone today that the Holy Spirit is telling you that you need to respond to him today and put Jesus at the forefront of your life as your personal Lord and Savior. Well, praise God. Then as believers gathered here this morning in this sanctuary to worship the shepherd who truly cares for us, who laid down his life for us, who are blessed here and now as well as in the future, in the flock of the Lord, May we offer our praise and worship to him as we go to him now in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we do come to you as believers, as those that know you, know your voice, and we follow you. Maybe not exactly and maybe not perfectly, but Father God, that even as we wander, that you are sure and can be counted on and faithful to come and to correct us, to rebuke and to get us back in line. Father God, that when we fall into danger, that you are there to protect us as well. Lord, I'm very thankful for all those that are here, that they have the assurance and the confidence of knowing you as their shepherd and all the benefits that go along with that relationship. If there be anybody that they meet this week or that I should meet or that might hear this 
message at some later time that does not know you. May they be able to sincerely humble their hearts, surrender their will to you, put their faith and trust in you, and be able to claim the promises that go along with knowing you as their shepherd. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the good shepherd that he is. We thank you for being counted as one of your sheep. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.